<laughs> the broadcast is live. We're live now. Okay. There we go. Live. Right. <laughs> we made it. We made it. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jordan Elizabeth Gelber. I am the CEO of Aperture, and this is our first installment of Aperture Insights, which is a new course that we're doing with Catalyst. Uh, today, I'm joined by my good friend and head of development at Aperture, Jadas Gupta, and we apologize for the technical difficulties. We love technology, but we're here for it. Uh, so, hi, Jay. Hi, Jordan. Uh, <laughs> hi, everybody at Catalyst. This is great. I'm, I'm excited about this. Cool, me too, me too. All right, I'm gonna pull up the Facebook feed as well to see, make sure we can see everybody. Um, so yeah, I guess to get started, we'll just talk a little bit about um, Aperture and we'll tell everybody what we're doing and why we're doing it. So let me open up everything. All right, great. So um, today we are focused on development from ideation to production, uh, but to kind of rewind a little bit, um, our company, Aperture, is a two-sided marketplace in the entertainment industry. We connect buyers, which are the big box distributors and producers, et cetera, and we connect them with high quality original content. So we work in a, a three compartment uh, kind of structure where on the front end, we have a big talent acquisition process and we have a front end creative agency, which Jay is a part of. And then after he works with those uh, pieces and screens them to either come on our platform because we have a streaming platform or we take them to development, Jay is the guy that kind of oversees everything and he helps take it to the next level, which is our content pipeline where we start uh, promoting projects, putting it up on our OTT platform and also taking it to our sales team because everything we take in, we also sell on the back end. Um, but yeah, I think just the biggest thing about Aperture is we're brand new. You can find us on Roku, on Apple TV, Fire TV, iOS, Android. And I think I missed one, Apple TV, but you can go check it out today. But before that, come check out what we're doing here. And I'm gonna stop saying check out and Jay, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself. And sure. I'm gonna see if we have some listeners. Hi everybody, I am Jay Dasgupta. Um, like Jordan mentioned, I am the head of, uh, head of development at Aperture, along with uh, many other things that I do. But just to sort of tell you why I'm here, uh, I went to school at USC for film school, and then, you know, I was a, I am a writer and director, and uh, it got my start in the business, in the film industry, by working with a company uh, as part of their development team, right? And actually, interestingly enough, because uh, the Television Academy Foundation is uh, part of this, I want to give them a big shout because they were instrumental in getting me that start. I was part of their uh, internship program and that launched my career uh, in a big way, right? Like those guys helped me out. They put me in touch with this production company. I was on the development team for that production company for a while. And then out of that, I started my own development company which then partner with many other production companies as they were sort of building their slates. And <clears throat> while that was going on, uh, I got to sort of like direct for commercials and music videos and stuff. And also uh, digital platforms like Hooked and Snap or whatever, right? Um, from there on, I got sort of noticed by a few people and I ended up working for Kevin Williamson's uh, Tell Me a Story show. That, that was the show's name, Tell Me a Story. And uh, yeah. that was how Jordan and I met. Mm -hmm. We met on Clubhouse. Yep. In, the, That's in the world of COVID, when all of us were at home kind of figuring out what we're going to do next, Jay and I encountered each other on Clubhouse and just kept talking and building and discussing some platforms like Hooked and how uh, kind of technology and streaming platforms are going to take over um, just how projects are being made. Uh, so while we're waiting for more people to come in, I think I'm going to ask you a couple questions, even of though course. I don't know the answers, but I think it's good for everyone else to know. Um, so in terms of head of development, I guess, what would what does that mean? What does that entail? Because many people, we know that Catalyst is all about um, storytelling and series progression and digital series and, and you know um, web series pilots, et cetera. But it's very different in many ways from producing a feature film or a short film 
as well as very similar in many ways to producing a feature film or short film. Um, but for you, when you work with a new project and you develop a project, what are the steps you take to do that? Right. So, <clears throat> I mean, development, you know, the, the topic being that it's from ideation to production, mm -hmm. uh, that's what it is, right? So as in general, uh, as a development executive, you are basically in charge of creating the slate for whatever you are creating a slate for. It could be for a studio, it could be for a production company, it could be for a digital platform, you know, but mainly you're in charge of sort of, you know, getting the tone and the look of it right, right? Uh, now, different development companies do different things, right? Some, I mean, you could have a production slash development company that does, you know, uh, like my old boss does family drama. That's what he does. Um, and so, you know, he, you, you can sort of find your niche and kind of like stay in that lane, or you can be sort of an, uh, kind of cast a wide net, like we do at Aperture, mm -hmm. uh, like Catalyst sort of does, right? Like it's, they welcome all sorts of, um, submissions to their program. Um, for Aperture specifically, uh, what I do is we screen, you know, almost hundreds of <laughs> submissions. Uh, and then we sort of uh, go through talking about the merits and sort of like the strengths and the weaknesses of each project. And, you know, the truth about all of this is always going to be, is that there's always going to be far more good creators than there are opportunities, right? So like, 100%. this is a big thing to talk about because I want everybody listening to understand that like, just because your project doesn't get the recognition or even the response that you want, doesn't mean it was anything to do with your project because from a development side, it's not just how good your project has to be. And it has to be, by the way. Right. It has to be visually striking. It has to have good stories. It has to have good characters. You have to have had thought about where your story is going to go. All of those things are just the base requirement for you to get noticed. But there's a bigger sort of barrier on the development side for us because we're constantly measuring what goes into a slate. So let's first define what a slate is for Great companies, place right? Start. Yeah. So a slate is for any development company or production company or studio or anything like that is what we're going to release together or in a, sh in a sort of a determined time period, right? Now that could be every month. It could be every year. It could be uh, six months or whatever, right? Like a predetermined time. So for us at Aperture, the way we decided was like, okay, for the first slate, we're going to look for eight projects and that's the slate. It's going to be small, but it's going to be quality driven. So we only want to go for eight projects and that's going to be sort of our first season of shows. Right. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> Before you continue, that, I have a yeah. question for you, actually, because I think that it's important, you know, for us, this is so second nature. And I think right. that, you know, we're, we're deep in the thick of it. We're, we see what we want to see now because we're so focused on really recognizing strong points when it comes to projects that we want to develop. When you were looking at the eight projects that we currently have out of hundreds of projects that we watched, um, what were some of the markers of quality that you considered looking at it. When you look at a project, when you're about to take them on, even when you're about to have a meeting with them, because I think a lot of people um, from Catalyst have submitted to us and we had great meetings with them, but they, mm -hmm. in our mind, weren't ready to, to be taken on by our team. So how do you define um, like people that you know we're going to take to the next level and that you want to work with? Right. Um, two ways, right? First of all, the visual quality, right? I mean, there's unfortunately if we are putting up a proof of concept short mm -hmm. right it has to be visually engaging enough not just for us at aperture or at or even at catalyst or at the tv academy right um but 
the reason it has to be visually engaging is because eventually we are going to help you get seen by agents or managers or execs at production companies or whatever, right? And unfortunate nature of this industry is that that person or those people, whoever they are, um, whoever watches your uh, project, they're watching 50 projects at a time, right? And it's like, or, you, or, or. <laughs> you really have to be striking mm -hmm. in that, in, in not just in your project, but in that first one minute, in that first five minutes, and sometimes if they ever get to it, the first 10 minutes, right? And um, so that's a big thing, visual, visual presentation. Like, how is this actually shot well? Is this directed well? Is this acted well? All of that is great, but let me tell you, that's not where most people lose out, right? It's just, that's just the basic sort of the, you know, the base level, but where it really falls apart for a lot of good people who, you know, have made great proof of concept shorts is that they, it looks really great, but then the story isn't there. Right. Yep, it's very yeah. unbalanced. It's very, very unbalanced. Yeah, and yeah. that's sort of, and you know, we face we. I mean, look, there's a reason we saw hundreds of hundreds of projects, and we picked eight. Um, mm -hmm. There's, it's a hard balance, and nobody faults anybody for not achieving it, right? Because like the difference between what is okay and what is good is razor thin. The difference between what is good and what is great is razor thin, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's incredibly hard, even for very, very seasoned filmmakers and execs to be able to say like, oh, this thing worked and it was great. Let's just do that again. And that's going to work. carbon copy it. <laughs> right. And yeah. people try that. I mean, it, <laughs> our entire new life in Hollywood where everything is a remake or a sequel or a prequel or a reboot is it, just, yeah. Or a reboot. That's just what that is. Right. Like people being afraid to try new things. Um, but you can't fault them either. Right. Like you have to understand these are execs whose jobs hang on the balance of like green lighting, something that costs $60 million. And then if it doesn't go well, someone has to answer for it. So, you know, obviously we want to get to a place where we have great stories and great new stories, right? Uh, and especially we will have to, because if we are to have more diversity, more inclusion, that mm -hmm. just means we can't be rebooting things. Oh, uh, yeah. We have to tell new stories and, um, to be able to tell new stories, I think we have to learn how to do it right. Um, yeah, I think that the point you're making is really strong because not only because, you know, we want to see great storytelling, but I think that a lot of um, creators that we've seen or even just projects that you and I have been invited to produce on, let alone, you know, help we know what we're doing in Aperture, but independently, is that they rely so much on having the coolest equipment sometimes or the biggest talent mm -hmm. that the story is where it falls. But if anyone has recognized or realized over the last few years, it's really the, the festival darlings are projects that didn't have the highest quality necessarily in terms of like, was it shot on a red? I remember there was a year where everyone just wanted to shoot on red mm -hmm. or, or like full of like big name talent or, or people with a big social media presence. Like, I think that everything is a bit more disrupted now in a positive way, but the, the one through line is that if you rely on the quality of your story, which is the whole reason you're making this project, that will shine if you're dedicated to, to really exquisite storytelling. And it doesn't have to be like a big fancy drama, but if, you're, if you have a nice story that has a follow through, we can understand, and you really take in the time to develop your characters, to develop, you know, your story arcs, to develop, you know, your A and B lines for those that are, you know, making series and stuff. I think that that's a lesson that we would want other people to realize, but other filmmakers to realize, which is like, focus on your story development before you decide that like, oh, I want to shoot on this big stuff. Cause it's only gonna, the high quality equipment 
is only going to highlight those holes in your story even more because it's so cinematically beautiful. It's going to highlight those problems, not help those problems. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, like, um, <clears throat> I mean, we can both talk about this. There are plenty of shows that we saw that were visually striking, but we just knew they couldn't be put on aperture because we just, you know, the story didn't flow properly. Right. And we knew from looking at it that there would have to be immense reshoots mm -hmm. or like crazy re-editing to like make the story work. And, you know, mostly whenever we can figure out how we're going to make the story work, it's, it's not, a, you know, it, it doesn't mean we are not looking forward to the next project by that creator, but we certainly can't do much with it. Right. Like, um it's easier to say like hey go recolor this <laughs> show, you know this proof of concept or like go re-edit this then to be like oh, your story is broken and now i we have to re you know rejigger this thing and that's a that's a harder climb every time every time and i think you know even from just let's forget that we're looking at it from a exec or a production side let's actually look at it from the creative side for a second mm -hmm. it is more beneficial and cheaper 100 percent, for you to rework your story a thousand times and get the script to the level that it needs to get to before you start shooting then like shoot something and then say like okay well you know i'm missing this scene i'll pick it up Pickups are not not cheap, you know. No. Pickups are not cheap. Reshoots are not cheap. Um, mm -hmm. God forbid there's VFX involved on top of that. That's not cheap either, right? And it's, I mean, yes, everything is getting cheaper comparatively than they used to be, and we are democratizing filmmaking in a big way, and that's that should be encouraging to every single person who is not just a filmmaker but a storyteller, right? Like. Yeah. People who can tell stories should get into film because, uh, I mean, I, by film, I mean film and TV commercials, whatever. Um, I mean, all of it, the big F. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it made it easier for you to tell a story. What we have lost in the process of making it easier is that we've gotten gear heavy yeah. and we've forgotten how to tell good stories. and that seems to be the problem right now look i am on top of being a writer also a director and a cinematographer so like visuals are very important to me and you know i am probably in the minority of people who will watch like 2001 because it's beautiful and uh, as a bunch of times but like that's the minority Mo most yeah. most people don't come out of tv shows or films and go like hey man that little backlight in that scene uh lighting the lighting the talent really made, made everything just oh, yeah. pop right no <laughs> one's saying a lot anything along those lines they go i like this i don't like this because of whatever right yeah. and it's always the story uh, ultimately 95 to 99 percent of the time what you'll always remember is story it's like why did you like that film because of the story why did you not like <laughs> it didn't make sense right like that happens all the time like we've all been let down by great shows lost um <laughs> you know we get to the last season and we go what the fuck is this uh so you know that that kind of thing it's you have to have a big understanding of story and so should we just get into that kind of thing and like kind of talk about it and yeah i think that what, for everyone watching, I know we have a few viewers right now. If you have questions, please feel free. We're just going to... Please do. Yeah. I yeah, mean, gonna, this would be... Jordan and I talk all the time. All so. the time. I mean, I love uh, I love everyone watching our conversation. Weekly conversation. <laughs> I'd rather help someone yeah. who actually has a question along the lines of development of like how to get something seen or shown. Yeah, I have some questions that people texted me, so I'm going to... Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna get into it. So I think uh, first of all, you know, one thing you mentioned about the story the story arc concept. You know, for a lot of people, everyone here is making shows. So if we're talking about show development, I think 
for me, my biggest concern would be what are red flags that you see when someone's developing a show? Because you and I both have uh, mixed feelings about pilots. Mm-hmm. But I feel at least I feel that people exhaust their resources into something in hopes that they're going to just take that and, and build on it. When the reality is that, like, you're not thinking about what you're hoping to happen when it gets picked up. You're only thinking about this stop right here. And there's, there's a whole block in a wall of terms of story development or like what you are your accomplishment is, or it's just like a short film. So to me, the red flags are always like, how did you make it? Why did you make it? Um, Why does the story need to be told? That's where I'm coming from. But I'd love to know from your perspective, from a development standpoint, because you're the one that's mostly working with these individuals, what are red flags for you when it comes to seeing certain projects, whether they're- Right, red flags for me, I mean, it's not so much, I mean, I'll answer it in terms of red flags, but it kind of tells you what, a good structure uh, of story is for TV shows or, I mean, let's talk about TVs, TV shows. Cause like, that's what we are sort of mostly concerned about. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a red flag, I mean, not so much red flag, but the things that I'm always looking for are story engines, right? Can't, you know, long time ago, someone would tell you that the big difference between film and TV was this. In film, at the end of the movie, the Death Star gets blown up. Mm-hmm. Spoiler alert. TV, <laughs> yeah, sorry. If, <laughs> if that's a spoiler alert for you, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> uh, but in TV, the Death Star could never get blown up, right? Like it would be every single episode, they're trying to make a plan for the Death Star getting blown up, and mm-hmm. it never gets blown up that's old tv right but that was the main sort of difference back then uh even all the way to the 90s uh and i think like the big show that really kind of changed that uh was sopranos right sopranos and wire kind of started changing that up and it that change wasn't fully fully realized till two two new shows came out which was well they're older now but breaking bad completely changed the fact that like characters can grow in TV and characters can have, you know, sort of like big arcs and also stories can have big arcs, right? Like Breaking Bad has a clear beginning, has a clear ending and it's all planned, right? Like, yes, they change a lot of things along the way. Jesse was supposed to be a kingpin. Jesse doesn't become a kingpin. That's all of those things. The, the, that's, that's just the, you know, genius of, Vince, um, anyways, but you know, breaking what Breaking Bad sort of made happen, and then certainly Game of Thrones also made happen was it changed the game of this thing of like we used to look for 10 seasons, you know, like there was the big sort of marker back in the day was. Uh, 100 episode series, right? Like that was the thing that every executive ever wanted. Mm-hmm. Now nobody wants that. Like they want three good seasons, five good seasons, and that's great. Like that's considered great TV now. Uh, and, you know, they're not even making 24 episodes or anything like that, or even 12 episodes per season. Now mm-hmm. most of these are like eight episodes, six episodes a season. So, it's gotten easier to do the arc that you want to do as an artist. It's gotten more democratized. The problem is that we're still missing the key elements, right? Like story engine still means, yeah, like unless it's a limited series, I still need you to deliver me three seasons worth of work, <laughs> right? So it has to go somewhere. Uh, characters, right? Like the biggest thing about TV versus film is that in film you're really kind of growing one main character maybe a few if it's like a two-hander two or three if it's a multi protagonist story Mm -hmm. but in tv you're you're really dealing with an ensemble cast in most cases most cases right sometimes it's even if it's like one primary character like tony soprano there's still other characters that are also pretty big right and they have to be developed as well so tv is all about characters 
We have a question. We have a question, and I think yeah. it's going to relate to what you're talking about. So, Jason Wheeler, I see your question. I'm going to pop it up on the screen. Uh, he says, "Great tips." So, we're talking at red flags right now, but I think you can also mirror it with this. As he's saying, "What is one thing that gets you excited when looking at a potential new project to develop?" So, right now, you're saying story engine. Remember yeah, story engine characters. characters. Right, mm -hmm. those are the two things that get me excited. I'll tell you the big way I know that a creative already knows what they're doing is mm -hmm. before I've had a chance to look at a tra trailer or a teaser or even their actual project. If someone delivers to me what I consider a good log line, right? Right. That yeah. tells me this is a person who has spent time and knows what they're doing, right? And so let's talk about what makes a good log line, right? Like a good log line, it's, I mean, again, look, this is this is a thing that's written two sentences. It's not that's visual. Not how, how, do, how, how do you know that a log line tells me anything about a creative person or their project, right? For every single professional, every agent, every manager, every executive, when they read a good log line, they know one, it's edited to the point where it is good. Yes. Two, every good log line will sort of like give you a full view of the project, right? So for example, let's say I'm writing about, and you know, like let's take the trope of like the, um, you know, like the old trope of like family moves into a haunted house oh, yeah, or, like, yeah. uh, or whatever, right? Like it's mm -hmm. like, so everybody's seen this. How do I, Jadis Gupta, say something about it that is unique, that is interesting and mm -hmm. still tells you that I know how to tell stories, right? And so I'm just gonna throw this up there. And so here's my log line that I just am saying as an example. It's okay, so here we go. Escaping a troubled past, an estranged Indian American family tries to reconnect and rebuild their lives together in a new home. But when a series of grisly murders strike their idyllic neighborhood full of deadly secrets, the family must band together if they are to survive one more night. Now, yeah, it's that's Halloween. a big, <laughs> big log line. Mm -hmm. But here's the big things that I am looking for, and uh, I'm sorry the banner went away. I can to put answer, the up. Yeah, uh, Jason's question is that look, I pitched something that's related to my experience. It has yeah. an Indian American thing going on, which connects me to the story and brings something new to this old trip of like this story thing, right? Like old house neighborhood, fish out of water stuff. Everybody's seen this, but they haven't seen my version of it. Right. Right. And so one of the big things I'm looking for whenever I'm talking to a creative person is whether it be a trailer, whether it be a teaser, whether it be a log line, is can you give me what is your part of it, right? Because 99% of the time we're not watching or seeing anything that's completely new right like it happens once in a while and it will keep happening as mm -hmm. technology keeps improving and changing it gives you new avenues and new opportunities to tell new stories but at the end of the day it's still going to get bogged down into two very basic kind of stories right like mm -hmm. and actually so yeah no, no i think um you know log lines are so important and for so many reasons for me, you know, because I'm going to also answer your question, Jason, um, it, for us, when I look at other projects to develop, because people submit to both me and Jay, it's the reason why the log line is so important is because we approach Aperture as if we're business consultants for content creators. And most of the time, if in, re in regular verticals of business, like in advertising, you would have a log line. It would be your company slogan. It would be something that really represents the brand. So we try to um, disrupt the thinking of the creative industry when we work with different uh, creators by saying, like, if you're an entrepreneur and this is your business, how are you presenting it? Because if you can't convince the other person why they should, you know, 
buy your product, for example, which I know it reduces the emotional love of creativity, but we also, we're trying to help people have successful careers in it. So, you know, we really try to take it from a very strong and nurturing standpoint. Um, but, you know, to me, it really shows that they thought this through beyond just like, oh, oh, I saw this thing, right? Like people say, right, what you know. When I went to LA Web Fest, that was one of the biggest takeaways I got when I first started getting into web series production and, and show production, um, like back in 2017, which was you write what you know. But a lot of people, they see projects like the haunt, the trope of the haunted house, the family moves in the haunted house. And they're like, oh, I'll just take that and remake it. And then we have all these reboots when they just think they can make it better, but they think they can make it better by just telling the same story differently versus putting what you know into it. I like the, I love the fact that you're bringing something that's related to you because we, when we were also work on projects, it's not just about the quality of the project itself, but the quality of the creator. You know, if you can tell us um, why you made this project, like, like why, like the, the royal why of why you made this project, like, you know, a great person that talks about why in terms of business is Simon Sinek, their why, it's important. You need to have a core of your story, like why this was being told. Because storytelling is something that's so personal, regardless if it's like a, you know, a, a ridiculous, like dark comedy, or if it's something that's cinematic like Game of Thrones. And also, why does this have to be made now? And why should we care? And a big part of why we should care is that if you're able to have a great log line, and you're really able to really hook us in in such a small place, um, it really shows us that you took the time, and we should care because you care. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And like, you know, the other thing, I mean, just to sort of answer this thing about logline, I mean, one, like I said, yeah, you know, we want to see something personal in, in there, but at the same time, you know, like what I'm trying to see is, do you know structure? You know, logline is a very, very good way to look, know if a creative knows structure or not, right? Like, so without going into my logline again, right, my logline had what the obstacles were right there is strange family mm -hmm. they're gonna have to like figure out how to get together before like they get killed like all of these things are already in that law line it tells you literally what that movie is going to be about without ever having seen a single scene right right and i will challenge i, I mean i think like every single creative person should should sort of take their time getting to you know so one of the things that we were talking about is ideation to production right mm -hmm. so ideation part is really really important because if you don't get that right everything suffers down the line right oh, yeah. and um i think it's very simple like more than log line it's kind of just i you know you have to kind of sit there and sort of figure it out because to get ideation right, you should think about kind of like the impact that you're trying to have, right? It's like, uh, and some of that comes from like your experience, but it also comes from like what other category. So, you know, like ideation is not just about what my story needs to be, but it's also like, where does my story fit into the grand scheme of shows, right? Like is it a medical drama is it or you know like i mean it's okay. is yeah it? is it a procedural is it i mean like yeah i mean it's a procedural uh so you know is it a thriller is you know that kind of stuff right and there's not no one saying that new show formats cannot be created certainly they can be right like we're about to see or uh sandman is happening and i haven't watched the episode of it but i'm pretty sure sandman is kind of different from every other show, right? Um, I watched so, a few episodes, I'll answer that for you. Yes, it's very different. So, you know, like you do, but I do think once people sort of figure out where their shows kind of fit in, it's mm -hmm. easier to like make the transition towards like getting to write it and, you know, and to then eventually make it and sell it, right? Because that's the dream to, to be able to like get your project out there. Um, I love that you brought up Sandman because I think that is is a really unique um, kind of case study. So mm -hmm. Sandman is a project that came out years ago. It was a graphic novel, and it's had so many iterations. I think they did an audiobook even last year. And even, even though Neil Gaiman, who wrote it, 
is part of the main team of Sandman today, the new the, the series, mm -hmm. he still evolved the project to be told in today's society. And I think that that is something really unique to look at. Like Jay and I, we have a project right now we might be working on, people bring us stuff all the time that's based on original source material. And it's about evolving that source material and telling it in a way that it easily translates from whatever it was, whether it was like a poem or a painting. I think there's a, a whole project made up of a painting like a year ago um, or an audio book or a podcast or, you know, you read a short story and it inspired you to create this big, you know, season, um, limited season or whatever. I mean, there, it's about really making it present for today. And I think that's a really good example of what you just said, which is, you know, where does it fit in in today's, you know, how, how people consume content and who you're making it for. Uh, so Jason, before we move on to another question, my big thing for you is make it about yourself or, you know, like the personal is right. Like mm -hmm. every good project is three things. It is personal. It is immediate. It, which means like, it has to be told right now. Right. And it also like the characters that are involved in it have to sort of deal with immediacy, right? Like it can't be mm -hmm. like, I mean, yes, Game of Thrones takes over, takes place over hundreds of years in theory, in theory, in, in the seven books. But like, still, you know, like it has to feel like, oh, someone is gonna die. <laughs> you know, the, the Tyrion uh, trial. Someone could die, right? Like it has to feel immediate, even if it takes place over hundreds of years. Um, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Should we go on to the next question? Yeah, there I'm waiting on some other questions, but I think that what I will do now is that since we're talking about what we look for, the things that get us excited, I'm going to talk about things that I that are my pet peeves when people talk to us or reach out to us because I think that sure. it's not just about the red flags, the project itself, but it's also the materials people have. So when you're creating the ideation of your project from ideation to conception, right? That's better. That's our theme for today. You know, there are multiple assets that you create along the way. And your script is a huge part of it, obviously. Um, your, you know, series Bible is a huge part of it. And I know everyone and their mom is going to tell me a pitch deck and all those great things. But, you know, I, what I learned last year through all of our lovely clubhouse conversations is the fact that I believe that the industry is oversaturated today with pitching. So by personalizing it, you really stand out in terms of your pitching. And what I've done with Jay is that I've created a five course meal of pitching. And so if you say that, like, um, if when I go out to like a luxury meal, the big thing on the, on the menu is always like the lava cake. It's something that's very decadent. It's rich. It's something you ask for only if you want it. And I consider pitch decks to be the lava cake of pitching <laughs> because to me, it's something I will ask for all that information. I will ask for if I want it. And if I ask for it, that's a pretty good sign. So I like to reverse engineer back from that because just like people don't think about telling the story the right way sometimes, they don't think about going from where they want to be and reverse engineering to all the steps that take them from point A to point B. So uh, yeah, so my pitch deck is like the lava cake. So if I go backwards, like what's my main course? What's my appetizer? What's my what's my taster? What, what's my palate? Every single item or every single aspect of your pitch materials should wet the palate to encourage the person you're trying to get involved to want the next course. So for example, a log line should mm -hmm. want people to find out more about your one sheet or your treatment or your Bible, but each step, you know, you should have something that tells just enough that it showcases that you have a third idea. And because you've done such a great job with your log line, you should know multiple ways to provide saturated material in a short form, um, you know, and, and really come through with it. So it's like, well, what do I want next? So I'm going to want to know your treatment. I just want a nice summary. I really want to know. And please tell me like where, for example, like where did this come from? How long have you been working on it? Uh, do you, have you begun? And then maybe I'll say, if you have a trailer, can you send me your trailer? If you have any scenes from it, if you shot it already, you know, can we see it? But it's like, let the people have steps. And I think that is another area that when it comes to, you know, concept, like we came up with this idea, I'm going to rush to production. I'm going to just go ask people to get involved and I'm going to get the LOIs, the talent I want. Like, you don't know when you're going to make this. Um, so I really think it's important to have every way to have an entry point 
into the industry by making sure you have thoroughly thought out materials that come in sequence so people can ask you and you're prepared and you don't give them everything. Showing all your cards is not the best trick. It's I know a lot of people think that uh, just like they think like I'm going to make a crazy budget is like a really cool thing. To write down. But I just think it's important to understand that it's OK that you're not rushing to camera right now. It's almost sometimes in your favor. If you really thought about creating a great project and you're looking to make it, having these things will help you even when you start submitting it to festivals like Catalyst. Because when you go to the festivals, you're going to say, OK, well, I'm going to take the most advantage of me submitting here because I have all this great material. I know exactly who I want to meet with. I know exactly who I want to talk to. And I have all these steps along the way that I've thoroughly thought out to make sure it all makes sense. So when they get that pitch deck, it has everything that they were that they wanted to discover that they hadn't received before. But it's not an oversaturated 40 page document that I'm right. not going to sit and go look through. Like you have to think about your end user, just like you have to think about where is your project going to fit in today's marketplace. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm glad you talked about this because it is true, right? Like, um, and I, I want to clarify a few things, but this goes back to what my point was going to be previously and I got distracted, uh, <laughs> which is that you can't skip the steps, right? Like yes. it should go from like log line to the one sheet, to the treatment, mm -hmm. to an outline. So like, and this is really important for all the writers out there because when you get contracts, when you get actual contracts in the, and deliverables that you have to make, it is very important that outline is part of it, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot, the way WGA payments sometimes happen is outlines and first draft is a certain percentage of your whatever you've made the deal for and then the f delivery of the rewrite and then you get the other percentage of whatever's left over right so the reason i stress this is because it's good habit as a writer to get into to go from like these small steps to these big steps right to do your log line and sometimes i will say the log line can come a little later in the game because you kind of have to understand your whole story to come up with a really good log line. Sometimes people start in log lines and that's great if you can do it. Uh, but some people can't and that's okay too. Like it's okay to reverse engineer the log line. Mm -hmm. But what you cannot skip is the treatment and the outline before you write. As I know a lot of people who write and look, there's this whole planters and architect thing about writing. And some people plan it all out. Some people just wing it. And you can wing it. You can certainly wing it for a while. But I'll guarantee you, uh, eventually you will come to the school of planning it out. Um, yeah. And I, because like, I'll tell you the worst feeling in the world is a page one rewrite. If you oh, thought yeah. like you, you wrote this great script and then, you know, someone looks at it and uh, they go, Hey, I love the idea. <laughs> That's right. one of the worst right. notes you can ever get, right? It's like, I love the idea. I don't know <laughs> what they're saying is that I don't love anything about the execution. <laughs> and it usually means like that. That's one of the, the most gut wrenching notes people can get. It's like, it means like, okay, well, you start over with that idea and like go at it again. Um, so yeah. I think it's really important mm -hmm. uh, to go through those steps. And like you said, every time you, you know, beyond, I, I do think like creatives at the very beginning when they're writing can't get too bogged up about the marketing and the planning and all of that stuff. First, you got to write it. First, you got to write it. I, then I also you, but yes, absolutely. By the time you're contacting Jordan or me, you should have definitely spent some time beyond the writing. Kind yeah, of I want to I want to take an experience if you don't mind from from like yeah, a of course. like me. So like I aside from Aperture, like Jay and I obviously have our own projects. I am a horrible writer. I try. I am not a good writer, but I come up with a lot of concepts and ideas. So even though I'm not the one necessarily writing it, it's important that I know how to do this so I can clearly express my idea and mm -hmm. find a writer 
who can fit this story idea that I have. It's absolutely. not because if, if you're not a writer, you shouldn't be writing. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You don't have to be the person that writes your own projects. In fact, many people hire writers to help them, but they become great showrunners. Like you should all know, especially people that are in this world of indie TV making, which is what we're doing right now. You should 100% understand the role of a showrunner, even if you're not the showrunner of your show. If you are, most of you want to be that person and want to be in the room, therefore you should understand how, you know, to be a showrunner. It, but if you're not a writer, that's okay. But at the same time, like to Jay's point, he's coming from a writer's perspective in many ways. I'm coming from a perspective of somebody that like, I can't wake up and say, oh, I have a great idea. I'm just going to throw this all out there. If, I, if I'm not able to express it and then just flying by the seat of my pants, it's never going to be well thought out. If I don't have, if I didn't outline like what the story is about, what the lessons to be learned are, what are the, what am I trying to highlight? What is the message that I want in there? Why is this person like this? What are the characters? And if you haven't thought all that out, then that's maybe something to, to have a talk with yourself because it's like, well, then why are you making it? You know? Um, yeah. I think important to to understand these things even if you're not writing it but also it's going to help you when you talk to a writer because it's also important to make sure that you have the right people in your corner but you also have to be the right person for them as well and be equally as prepared absolutely i mean i will say a couple of things here uh in tv you have to be there right right like yeah. if, you, if it's your if it's if you want to ever to get to the point where it's your show you have to be a writer uh tv is not for directors or i mean you know you can certainly make a name for yourself as a director in tv like miguel sapochnik david nutter all of these people right mm -hmm. great great directors but those are not the people who originate the show right yeah. in tv the origins of a show 99 percent of the time is going to be from a writing perspective mm -hmm. If you want to make and you know, if you want to create things and you're not, your strength is not that of a writer, then probably film is the way, right? Like it, it's easier to be known for being a great producer, for being a great director, for being a great cinematographer in film. Um, TV will always remain ultimately the writer's medium. And it has to be, it's kind of like theater, right? Like you don't go see, whoever directed, that's not why you're going. You're going to go watch a Tom Stoppard play. You're going to, <laughs> you know, you're I'm trying to see, to see a, you know, Ryan Murphy show or a Kevin Williamson show or Aaron Sorkin show, right? Like that's, that's what this is about. Projects, yeah. Right. And like, um, so that, that part is important. I mean, it, it is very important to know what your strengths are and mm -hmm. it's okay for you to not, be a TV writer and realize like, hey, I got to do something in film. Completely cool. Um, the one thing I do want to clarify on was something about a show Bible, which I call a primer because I'm not Christian and we should get rid of that term. Um, Agreed. But, <laughs> you know, whether it's a primer or Bible, here's the thing, a clarification. I know a lot of, lot of people talk about show Bibles, but in reality, the show Bible is not a thing that the writer has to worry about or the creator has to worry about at the beginning, right? Unless you are coming from something that you're gonna, that requires a lot of world building and then needs to, you know, ha or is coming from like a place where you could theoretically take that original material and turn it into graphic novel or a book or something. Mm -hmm. Unless it's coming from that kind of level of world building, you don't need a primer because in reality, primers slash show Bibles only happen after a show is on air. The reason those things exist is because they happen after the show has aired because it has to inform other directors who will come in to direct and other writers who will come in to write in the next few seasons how everything has worked out. Right. And what are the big things they got to know quickly? Um, so I know like the, that <laughs> uh, phrase gets thrown around, but it's very much like something that the writer doesn't need to worry about at the very beginning. I, I just think that the, the main takeaway from everything we just said is that 
even if you're not a writer now, you should be learning what's going on. And you should also be, absolutely you should also think all the way through from start to finish, reverse engineering every stage. Like even if you're not the person who's going to be the cinematographer, you want to make sure you know what to clearly explain a thing. I think that that's that's the biggest lesson that that I took away when I got into this this industry, which is that it's important to know what everyone's doing, because if you are the person coming up with the idea, you need to think about when I hand this over to people, what's going to happen and how am I going to make sure that exactly. it's not going to get diluted, which is the biggest concern people come to us with is with their, their artistic integrity will be diluted. I think the big takeaway is I'm dropping things. <laughs> I think the big takeaway is be organized with your thought process and make sure you don't skip a step. And yes, the log line normally comes afterwards, but that's after thorough organization and breaking down your story. And that'll yeah. only help you. Um, and I think another thing is, you know, story over visual quality matters, especially for people like us. That's one of the things that we get excited about is really a knack for storytelling. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that it's also, please don't just shove a pitch deck in an email. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's okay to just say, I have this great project, here's something about it, this is why I made it, I'd love to chat with you about it. That's a wonderful, easy way to contact us about it, because I know that some of you will probably ask how you can get a hold of us, which I'll say in a minute. But um, before we wrap up, I know we started a little bit late. Um, do you have any wrap up points you wanna make? And then I have a, two more questions and then we'll wrap up. Uh, yeah, sure. You know. I always want to, I mean, it, 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 this brings about this, fun, you know, I love John August and Craig Mason's show, Script Notes. And, you know, what I love about it is there's 500 some great episodes of it now. And they always talk about writing and film and TV and the business and everything else. And Craig said, you know, this entire show can be one thing write better right and it's like at the end of the day all of every all of film and tv can be summed up by that right like i spend a lot you know an inordinate amount of time on my first page for every single project because i know that first page has to pop yep every single time because they have to get to the second page. And I'll tell you, if they don't, that's it, it's done, right? And that, you know, like I was talking to Jordan and one of, so, you know, someone who wants to hire us for a project. And I was explaining that a good script takes 18 months to two years did everyone hear for that? For develop, right? Like <laughs> a feature. I mean, that's for a feature. That's I mean, feature. it doesn't necessarily but have to be that time. for. It. But yeah, that's yeah. that's the timeline, time. right? Like eighteen months. You're gonna dedicate eighteen months to this thing, for it to be ready, and, you know, it. You can't shortchange that in any way. I mean, I'm not saying it. You need to take. It, not everybody. Maybe other people are more industrious than me. Even though I do eighty to hundred hour weeks. It's whatever, you know, like someone may write 100 times better than me. So maybe it takes 12 months, maybe it takes six months. But you got to dedicate the time to it is the big thing. Because like exactly what, you know, the, the unfortunate nature of this beast is you have to think about who the end user is, right? Yeah. Uh, it's 100 is you know not just on the pitch deck minute time but it's uh, or on not just on the pitch deck uh front but just also on what's on paper right i have to think about as a writer not only am i writing a good story with good characters good good twists but when <laughs> my you know whatever the guy down the street reads this is that person or the woman down the street reads it are they gonna like it are they gonna read the next page and yeah. if you yeah. think like that's not gonna happen you better keep writing <laughs> you know and you just yeah. be honest about it with yourself like because and i think like as a writer please don't you try have to, to be able to like enjoy your story mm -hmm. if you don't trust me no one else is either 
Yeah, and I think it's about being authentic and enjoying your story. Like I, like I, the reason I say don't be clever is because so many mm -hmm. people try to like win the person over. Mm -hmm. The work should show up for itself. Right. And it should win thus over because you put the work, you were work in the work. It's not about like, oh, I thought this was really funny at this one period of time. I think it'd be really cool. <laughs> like yeah. if it serves a purpose, it serves a purpose. Um, yeah. No, uh, and before, I mean, definitely that, that is, by the way, what Jordan said is really, really important. Cl whenever there's a choice between clarity versus cleverness, you should always choose clarity mm -hmm. and you should always choose authenticity in of your voice right um the late great tony hoagland who was my poet mentor um told, like you know i used to write the stuff and he'd say jay you're a really clever writer <laughs> what you really should be is a clear writer and uh i've never forgotten that right like that's that thing is so very important clarity will go miles for you over cleverness right and everybody loves nolan and memento and inception and great if you love him i like him he's great um but not every story needs to be inception right what what every story does need to be is clear yep yeah and I, and I think that people will start realizing when they watch content now, what's clever versus what's clear. And, um, you know, and I think authenticity also goes a long way because it shows the, the reason why you're making it, like the reason why we should, you know, work with you because you want, you want this. It's something that drives you. Um, I think as we wrap up ideation to conception, right, that's, that's, that's our theme for today. Uh, Ideation to production. Thank you. <laughs> conception I, is. I keep saying conception because yeah. we've been talking about like building the concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, ideation to production. So because I messed up the title of my own thing, like, <laughs> professional guys. Um, it's the first one. It's the first one. Um, are there any last minute tips that you want to kind of uh, share? And anyone who's got any last minute questions, please comment below. We'll we'll wrap it up. Absolutely, absolutely. But, yeah. Um, the best thing from, you know, tips wise is have other people read your material, but you only trust. after, yeah, I'm sorry. That you trust people that you trust that you, yeah. People that you trust and people who supposedly are at your level or better. Um, and here's the other thing there it, that comes with a caveat. Often people will not know how to fix a problem. And that's okay. You have to realize when you get a note and you got to look, for, and this is why you got to have like two or three people read your thing because what you're looking for is not all these 20, you know, like don't go to 20 people and give them sh shit to read. Hey, that's crazy. Go to three people that you trust and give them three. And what that you're looking peers, for. That are your peers. Right. Um, what you're looking for is not that like this person X had this note or person Y had this note or whatever, and I got to incorporate it all. What you're looking for is what are the consistent notes? Where are they saying that like this is a problem, right? Like this keeps coming up. Why is your char this character is boring? Everybody thinks that out of the three pe people that you gave. Why is it happening? And now that's where what I mean. You got to look for the consist consensus in the notes. But the solution that the people suggest may not be the solution that you need, right? Yes. People can identify where things are not working really well. What they are, where they are not so good at is identifying how to fix it. So that's where like the person as the creative has to like kind of th rethink it and say, mm -hmm. okay, I got to do it my own way. Uh, so that's one big tip about consistency of notes and sort of learning how to fix it. Uh, the other big note is spend a lot of time on your first page. Seriously. I mean, your first page should be, I mean, and I, you know, like people make fun of airport terminal books and, you know, uh, Stephen King talks about how for a long time in his career he didn't get recognition for being a good writer because everybody thought you know he was this 
thriller writer, blah, 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 whatever, right? But the thing of it is, you really, I mean, as terrible as some some airport terminal books can be, you really got to get to this thing of like that first page turn, right? Like everybody's got to be able to do that. Uh, you can't wait on like your best thing happening in your fourth act in TV, right? Like um, that has to come up way before because uh, nobody is guaranteed that anyone will make get all the way through your script or through your show or through your proof of concept. If you can get my attention in the first page, if you can't get my attention in the first minute, we're, you're in trouble, especially okay. as young creatives, right? And I don't mean like young in age, but like no, as far as be experience. Be yeah. um, great, well, I, I think that um, the last thing to just mention is I know that a lot of people might want to find more about Aperture. You can find us at Aperture, A-P-E-R-T-E-U-R dot TV. And um, you can contact us on our website to get a hold of Jay. If you're interested in, in having our team look at your stuff, you can submit your materials there. Uh, but I think one uh, question I'd like to leave off with, Jay, because I think it's important, is going back to the pilot concept. I know a lot of people at Catalyst have made pilots. Um, mm -hmm. so them have been fortunate enough to make full series, even though they're short episodes, they're still a full series. Um, but we've seen a lot of pilots. Um, what is a wonderful way or a better way for people to leverage their pilots when it comes to development and it comes to production when they have something completed like that? That's a TV show. How can they better leverage it to get to the next stage? Well, <laughs> you know my answer. Um, it's the script. It's the <laughs> yeah. script, right? Uh, <laughs> The proof of concept, well, I mean, ideally, ideally, mm -hmm. uh, if you are writing a comedy show, your show should be around 20 to 24 minutes. Um, if you're writing drama, it should be around 44 to 52 minutes. Uh, in terms of uh, script, uh, version of that, you know, you're looking at 24 page script for a uh, maximum 20, 20 to 24 page, 22 to 24 pages for the comedy side, 50 to 55 pages, 55 pages being the max, by the way, uh, for the drama side. And like, say you have a great proof of concept, we love it. Where I think the big problem comes after we love you and we want to put you on aperture is right. that the script is not, and again the script doesn't have to be 100 percent, but it at least has to have that format where we can say like okay there's a script to work with now we can sort of give you notes and get you there that's the main thing because like trust me as great as a proof of concept will be or a pilot or even smaller episodes that are series would be None of that is going to get anything sold or get you a meeting. Uh, well, the, it'll get you a meeting, but what it will not do is it will not green light your yep. project, right? To get to the green light, you need to give a polished script yes. that, you know, wows everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that script, it needs to go back to that thing of, does it have story engine? Does it have good characters? Does it understand structure? Can I, can I, can I see what, you know, like the big, big question that execs love to ask is like, what does the third episode look like? Mm -hmm. What does the fifth episode look like? And you should intuitively yeah. be able to tell what that is. Yeah, you should be able to see forward beyond the first episode. And I think a lot of people, they focus, like I said earlier, they focus so much on making this one staccato moment they forget there's a world after that. Uh, mm -hmm. so I think that I think going back to the beginning is a great place to end. So I just want to say thank you, everybody who watched today, especially on our first uh, course of Aperture Insight with the wonderful Jay Das Gupta. Um, Jay, can you please let everyone know where they can find you? 
Of course. Uh, my name is Jadas Gupta, J A Y D A S G U P T A, P as in Paul, T as in Thomas, A. And so they can find me on Instagram for sure. That would be probably the easiest way to contact me. And they can also contact me through Aperture, uh, A P E R T E U R. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yep, either of those would be great. Um, uh, yeah. That's really the best way. Probably Instagram is the best way. Yep. yep and I'll say that uh, starting in the next few weeks, uh, we will be having uh, consulting meetings on our new friends, uh, Filmocracy. So if you do want to meet with Jay and have a consulting meeting to talk about your project and find out more how the Aperture team can help you with your project and take it to the next level and maybe even get it made or sold, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. And thanks again. Again, I'm Jordan Elizabeth Gelber. This is Aperture Insights. Tune in next week at 5 p.m. EST for another special guest. I will announce it next week. But thank you, Jay, for being awesome. awesome. Thank you, Jordan. It was great. And uh, thanks to Catalyst for helping us do this. Great. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Talk to you Bye. soon. Bye. Bye.